All right, here we go. Um, our last uh, panel session. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to the members of our last panel. The moderator of this session is Kevin Blackstone, an award-winning, to my immediate left, uh, an award-winning national sports columnist, uh, now at the Washington Post, a panelist on ESPN's Around the Horn, and a professor at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, and he's very proud of his group of award winners, I'm sure. To Kevin's left is the Honorable Lori Trahan, Congresswoman from Massachusetts 3rd District, uh, and a former Division I volleyball player at Georgetown. Um, Congresswoman Trahan has to leave early to catch a plane flight, but not before the group has a chance to pick her brain on the College Athletics uh, Freedom Act and NILs. Sitting to her left is another athlete, former NBA player, a former Maryland congressman, you just met him, now CEO of the Lead One Association, consisting of all the FBS athletic directors, the Honorable Tom McMillan. To Tom's left is Julie Summer, a Seattle attorney, member of the Drake Group Board of Directors. And, say again? Oh, you're okay. supposed to switch. <laughs> it's boy, girl, boy, girl. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay. So to Tom's left is Casey, Casey Schwab, and um, Casey does not have an academic credential. Um, he tried out for football but was injured, but he's the CEO and founding partner of Altia Sports Par Partners, a company that is helping educate um, uh, institutions and athletes to cope with this new world of NILs, but he does have a national ranking. Um, he is a recipient of the Sports Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award last year. Uh, and to his left is uh, Julie Summer, a Seattle attorney, a member of the Drake Group Board of Directors. Um, and if we are comparing sports credentials, she may be the pick of the, the, the crop here. Um, she's a former US national team member and world ranked swimmer in her younger years. Um, and so Kevin, it's all yours. Thank you very much. And I can say I have uh, some degrees of uh, separation from everybody at the table, except for Congresswoman Trahan, who I just, I just met. Um, uh, before we start, I just want to say, I uh, just want to acknowledge that the land that we are on is the, uh, the uh, ancestral land of the uh, Anacostan people, the Piscataway people, um, who, who suffered uh, replacement theory in this, uh, in this, this uh, country or, or in this land uh, some 500 years ago. Um, I also want to say I'm grateful to a lot of the acad academicians, scholars in this, um, in this room who over the years I've, I've interviewed when talking about uh, college issues like Professor Sack, um, uh, Fritz Polite who's out there, uh, Emmett Gill, um, some other folks who've really helped me crystallize uh, my thoughts about um, what college uh, sports are supposed to be and, and what they really are. And the last thing I want to say is, um, you know, as I've come to understand this issue, and as particularly as we're going to talk about I, NIL, uh, I think some people have been reluctant uh, to really recognize the essence of this issue. And to me, the essence of this issue is it's a black male issue. Um, because without um, black males in college sports, uh, the largesse that has uh, made uh, so many people um, so wealthy and the discussions that we have about the amount of money that um, this, uh, uh, this um, uh, industry rakes in, uh, we really wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, so I'd like to really um, uh, keep that in mind. I was thinking when my, uh, my old college um, mate, <clears throat> uh, Christine Brennan, was sitting here um, in her purple, I'm representing my purple for Northwestern, um, which tried to unionize um, uh, just a few years ago, uh, and, and, and she mentioned the, the crisis of mental health um, uh, that we're focusing on right now. Um, you know, just two years ago, uh, there were two athletes who, um, in the span of a few short weeks, uh, two black male athletes who took their lives um, uh, stepping in front of speeding trains. Uh, one was named uh, Bryce Gowdy, who's a top recruit to uh, Georgia Tech, and the other one was Cassius Winston's um, brother, Zachary Winston, who was a basketball player. Um, and, you know, when we talk about mental health, um, we need to recognize that because uh, for 
numerous reasons, um, black males in this country have a suicide rate that is trending upwards right now when the suicide rate for just about every other demographic um, is staying the same or trending other, other way. So I just wanted to say that. And I'm glad to be sitting here with people because, with, with these folks, because um, these folks are action folks. Um, and a lot of people in this room are action folks. And I'd really like to retire the word conversation um, because we've had enough of that over the last 20, 30 years talking about college sports. And so with that, I turn to Representative Trahan uh, to ask her about her legislation, uh, why she drew it up, um, what it intends to do, and, and where it is right now. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, certainly, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, thank you for touching on so many important points uh, just to launch into not this conversation. <laughs> uh, but I will, uh, look, this is, you know, uh, an issue that hits home. I, uh, I played Division I volleyball uh, at Georgetown University. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. There's zero chance I would have gone to Georgetown or anything quite like it if not for the fact that I got that scholarship. And I think that is also something we have to recognize in college sports. Uh, as my parents were so thrilled um, to have the peace of mind knowing that I had a meal plan and I had my education paid for uh, and that I was going to be fed and I was going to be housed, um, they, didn't, they didn't give out tampons at the, <laughs> at, the food, at the mess hall, right? They don't give you free notebooks or highlighters, all the incidentals that you need. And by the way, you can't work when you're a college athlete. So everything I did in high school from picking up shifts and waitressing tables, all of that stops suddenly, right? You can't intern, you can't go abroad, you can't, uh, you certainly can't get a job. And so you have not only no means to make money, um, but you, you are without. And so I think that's a really important like context. Most college athletes are just like that. And so meanwhile, the NCAA is raking in billions of dollars on the backs of the hard work of the people who are literally uh, um, killing themselves uh, to play for their sport and for their school. And something has to change there. Uh, and so, look, it got to the point where I couldn't even coach a, uh, a volleyball camp in the summer uh, because it would have it would have violated my amateur status. Now just think about how ridiculous that is that we're talking about amateur status and my inability to nurture the next generation of young volleyball players who want to look up to me as a role model and I would love to be. So a lot wrong there. Look, the legislation I, uh, I co-authored with uh, Senator Murphy is quite simple and it's elegant in its uh, simplicity, frankly. Uh, we want to give all athletes the ability to market their name, image, and likeness without restriction. We want enforcement by the FTC when that doesn't happen, and we also want private uh, right of action uh, so that there is actually teeth in this bill. Uh, and certainly we want to make sure that if institutions are creating support systems for how to become an entrepreneur, how to take advantage of this, that they're doing that for all students across all sports. So thank you. Thank you. And, and Julie, you've been tracking um, name, image, likeness uh, legislation um, across the country. Uh, and now we see uh, something at a national level. Uh, please tell the audience what you've seen and, and where we are right now. Sure. Yeah, I guess you could say I, I drew the short end of the straw there, but I actually volunteered for that. I thought it would be a good idea for track, to track that. And sure enough, it, it became like a, a game of whack-a-mole once uh, California passed uh, Nancy Skinner's bill in September of 2019, when Gavin Newsom signed that. Um, there was a little bit of a lull with the pandemic and the lockdown, and then states started to, to follow suit and introduce their own bills. But rather than um, you know tick down all of the different states, there were 28, about 28 that had passed by January of this year, um, and they all vary to some degree. Uh, but obviously they lend you know, the new publicity rights for, for college athletes, which is a great thing. Um, so this was uh, through 2019 to 2021. Um, it was the states that leading up to the uh, NCAA amending their own bylaws with what became really basically cursory guidelines soon after the Alston decision, which was not an NIL case, but certainly influenced how the NCAA would react to that. 
And then, of course, we, we all probably know that Florida really took the, the proverbial ball and, and made their effective date July 1st of this year. I'm sorry, last year, 2021. So um, it was a significant amount of activity for the last couple of years um, occurring at the state level. And, and the problem, of course, as Howard Bryant alluded earlier, there's always been chaos, but now we have chaos upon chaos. And this is, um, you know, the problem has been, of course, with the NIL uh, patchwork that we have right now is it, it really truly is like a wild west. Um, they're relatively narrow bills. They, they vary to some degree. Um, and again, rather than droning on about each of those bills, I think the real issue now for where we are today is how many have been passed, but how many are being repealed, right? This is where we are now. So I sort of think of it as after the Supreme Court opened the door, after the NCA essentially opened the door, um, the issue now is, is the repealing, the amending of laws. And I sort of think of it, and looking back now for the last two and a half years, it's, it's sort of come in about three waves. We had the waves of California and Florida and several over 28 states, you know, passing bills. Um, and then uh, the second phase after the Supreme Court uh, acted in Alston and the NCA guidelines that we had a few that passed a few more, maybe not knowing what was going to happen because no one really does. And that was sort of a ripple. And then the third wave now, of course, is are the amendments and the repeals, right? And so um, just a, a few of those examples because there have been several is Alabama. They passed and repealed a law completely. Florida passed and amended to allow fa uh, facilitation of NAI, NAL deals. Um, most states had prohibited that, of course. Uh, Tennessee passed and broadened their NIL um, to allow interactions between the collectives, which we've talked about a little about, I'm sure we'll talk about here, um, coaches and athletes. Uh, Louisiana and Illinois, uh, they're looking to allow uh, booster involvement now. And Missouri passed and made more amendments to expand, of course, what the NCAA rules allow. So now, after these waves, I kind of feel like now we're in the riptide. <laughs> we're all being carried out to sea. We have no idea what's really going to happen, right? So, um, and the why is because there are no real rules, and there, there's no reigning in. There's really no enforcement actually going on. And the, the funny thing is, I think when you look back now, is that California seemed to have created a, a model NIL bill um, that's no longer the case, right? So if, if the goal is to, you know, not the cynical way to look at it, but if the goal is to win football and basketball games at any cost, it's in the state's best interest to essentially not have a law or, or you know, greatly broaden it. So um, it's, it's funny when you look back at the time, Nancy Skinner's bill was looked at as groundbreaking, but now it looks rather conservative. So <laughs> we're in this whole new area of, uh, you know, the NCA's new effort just last week, wanting to crack down on inducements, pay for play, uh, the collectives, um, but there's no real meaningful enforcement. Which makes me scratch my head, Tom, because for, since the 19, early 1980s when the money started to flow freely from television into college football, um, college coaches, football, men's basketball, started to see their salaries go up exponentially. Mm -hmm. And no one controlled this profligate spending in college sports. And now, you, NIL is not a year old. Not a year old. And all of a sudden, the NCAA and some member institutions have decided to, to reel it in, to cap it off. What's happening? Why, why is this all of a sudden a big concern for the laborers, and it wasn't a big concern or a concern at all for those who manage the laborers. Well, a little history. Uh, I remember in 91, almost over 30 years ago, we were having a hearing. It was in the committee that Lori serves on, the Commerce Committee. And we were just approaching the first million dollar football coach. And I said at the time, I said, if we don't get that under control, we're going to have million dollar players. Because you can't have unfettered rights, unrestricted rights on one side and not have the other side. Here we are, fast forward. I. I don't want our world to go into a mirror image in football and basketball, the NBA and the NFL. And so I say that loud and clear. I think all the excesses need to be looked at. Uh, and we need a new social contract for athletes. And that has to be probably different for football and basketball, but it, definitely we need a new 
social contracts. So with respect to NIL, look, I think 100% of RADs are in favor of a student having the right to monetize their name, image, and likeness, just like any other student. The issue that is causing concern here is that, is it really name, image, and likeness, or are we seeing sort of ill forms of recruiting inducements and those kinds of things, pay for play, that really cross the line and really raise questions as to definitionally, you know, what are we trying to do here for student athletes? We want them to be able to work in a camp, uh, which I could do, and then they changed it where you couldn't do it. We want them to be able to, to use social influence to make money. We want them to be able to make money. But what you don't want necessarily is school A, rich booster, saying, I'm going to give this young athlete a million dollars to come to my school. And I think that's a line, because here's the point. College sports is the only organization in America where you rely on talent acquisition through recruiting. The pros use drafts and, and things like that. Colleges use recruiting. And so it's really important that that be fair and equitable. That's, I think, important for the enterprise of college sports. So here's, here's my point. NIL, I think we're all for it. It should be, students should have the right to monetize fully. But I think we have to look at some of the areas that are being used and put some modest regulation in to control some of the boosters and so forth that are, that are, are, are starting to impinge on the system. One last point. The whole idea of collectives forming outside the school where boosters are coming together to do this is absurd in its own right. This should have all been put under the school where the school right today, they keep track of inter internships for student athletes, they make sure they have tutoring, they make sure they have jobs after their career. Why not have a whole licensing department to make sure that young women and young male athletes have the best licensing opportunities and make sure that that's all equitable under Title IX. But to put it outside with boosters, totally outside the control of the university, seems to be like a flawed system. So anyway, just some general comments. Well, okay, Casey, so this is what you do. Yeah. I mean, you're working with universities to, uh, uh, to essentially to put together these NIL mechanisms. Are they even prepared uh, to do that at this yeah. point. Yeah, so I, I'm probably the, the closest day to day. We have a couple of our staff members here. Um, our firm works for schools to go in and educate the athletes. And that's where we started. And to Tom's point, um, you know, my background is with the, in the NFL world, the NFL Players Association. Uh, it was very clear in my past life that NFL players didn't have the adequate resources needed to go out and um, monetize their NIL to do their, to do their deals. Um, financial literacy, mental health support. And you're talking about um, one, they're, they're grown men, the NFL players, and two, they're making a salary that allows them to surround, to surround themselves with people who are professionals. And what we saw two years ago, and Tom was one of the first people that I talked to about this, is how is this new ecosystem going to be placed upon this, this existing ecosystem of, of college athletics that there's no, there's no equal to it. Because you have two North Stars. You have revenue. We all know it's a business. And then you have this other student athlete welfare, nonprofit sort of North Star that doesn't exist in the pros. And so backing up two years, uh, we, my partners and I, we, we said this is, this is not going to work. And nobody knew exactly what that was going to mean. But now we're seeing it. And to Tom's point, um, I couldn't agree more. This should have been, from day one, uh, just another thing um, that is under the, the school and the athletics department, the athletics director's uh, purview, not to control it, not to control what they, the, the student athletes can and cannot do, or the college athletes can and cannot do, um, but to provide them the support necessary so that the boosters are not out there uh, buying athletes. And now we're in this, now we're in this world that frankly, I, I think everybody's going, wait a second, we got it wrong. We need, we, we need to support these athletes because they don't, they don't have people around them to protect them from the boosters that have um, uh, ulterior motives potentially, but there's no enforcement mechanism of the boosters. Um, and, that's, and that's what we're seeing right now. The other thing I wanted to say is um, boots on the ground, going to campuses. 
Um, our staff and myself, we're on two to three campuses a week. We're meeting with athletes, we're meeting with coaches, we're me meeting with administrators about this. Um, by and large, the a most, most athletes, they're, they're, there's the five to eight percent of the superstars. And they're gonna get the, the, the traditional marketing deals. So they're gonna, get, they're gonna sell a bunch of jerseys through Fanatics. They're gonna go and they're gonna do a Dr. Pepper deal or a Visa deal, okay? They're, they're gonna have representation. The CIAs of the world, the WMEs of the world, the, the representation that no, they know what they're doing. That is a good thing. There's a second group of the social media stars that it really doesn't matter if they're athletes or not. Most of their stardom, their, their, the value that they can create is independent of that. They, they should be able to have representation and make as much money as they possibly can. And then there's this third group of call it 85% of the athletes. And most of them, I can tell you firsthand, are interested, they want to learn from this, but it's, it's, not gonna, um, it's not going to change their life dramatically. It's an opportunity to, to be their own CEO, is the way we say it to them. It's an opportunity to learn how to be an entrepreneur. It's an opportunity to learn about taxes. You know, l learn about what ta taxes mean. Learn about what intellectual property is. Um, and I, I didn't, be, didn't plan this story, but the best story that I've had I was, with, I was in front of an SEC football team. And I had spent, um, myself, I went down there um, I, I, six weeks in a row with this SEC football team. I came back after the season. Um, and I said, hey guys, you guys, anybody remember the difference between editorial and commercial use of intellectual property? And a couple of the guys were like, yeah, 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 Commer commercial use is when we get paid. Editor editorial is like ESPN. And it was this moment of these guys are learning and, and I'm not naive. I, I, I understand that you can only do so much by hitting these athletes with education. But at the end of the day, like that's what this platform should be about is giving these athletes the opportunity to go out and make some money, sure, but to, to set them up for life after sport. Um, so that, that's my soapbox on it. And, and boots on the ground, right now, right now, this is not sustainable, where we are right now. It's not. Well, well Congresswoman, doesn't your bill restrict um, the uh, ability of institutions to control an athlete's NIL value? Mm. Yeah, and that is, you know, by design. I mean, look, I think if you go back to, uh, we, we did this bill a, a year ago uh, because there was a patchwork of state laws, and I gotta tell you, as a first generation college graduate, it was hard enough for me to sort of look at the Chapel Hill offer and the Georgetown offer. Now asking athletes to say, okay, so what are North Carolina state laws covering NIL versus uh, the District of Columbia. I mean, I didn't go, I get to go to my parents <laughs> who did not go to college and say, can you help me? We didn't have access to a stable of attorneys. And so, yes, a federal, uh, a federal standard is absolutely required if we're thinking about the athlete uh, and what's best for them. Now, could we have predicted um, that the rise of collectives would be, you know, what it is? Perhaps we could have. Um, I don't. I think we're learning a lot of lessons, uh, and I think we're we're likely going to have to, you know, figure out how we make sure that the student, uh, the athlete, is at the the center uh, of of this, and that you know we're uh, we're moving forward uh, responsibly with with policy. But you know, I think at the beginning, having a you know. <laughs> I mean, the critics right out of the gate were like, oh my gosh, if there's, Anna, if there's name, image, and likeness, the sky is going to fall, that's going to be the end of sports as we know it, and that was ridiculous. I mean, that was complete fear-mongering. We saw some very cool deals get signed right out of the gate by women, by women volleyball players. I mean, I never, I mean, you're right, I was thinking, you know, camps, social media, and all of a sudden you've got some athletes signing some pretty cool deals and being able to finally monetize their own name, image, and likeness. And so I'd like to learn those lessons first before I put guardrails on what we need to sort of caution against. And I think the rise of collectives is definitely one that we have to monitor and we have to look at. But I would caution, before we all sort of jump and try to restrict, let's see, uh, let's learn more lessons, let's figure out how these, uh, these athletes can, can benefit more so, so that we're. So do you want to allow for an open market for amateur athletes? And I'm thinking those going from high school to college, because it's 
Professor Sack pointed out, they're really no, no longer amateurs. Look, we're, there, there's no amateurs. I mean, that's, that's been gone for a long, long time. I mean, I, I don't, I think everyone in the room can agree that, you know, when we sent the dream team to the Olympics, I mean, that was the end of amateurism as we knew it. Uh, so we should just, like, get rid of that term. It doesn't live in reality anymore. Uh, and what we should do is, look, we've got some incredibly talented athletes who are busting their butt, um, juggling more than most people can kind of comprehend to play at the highest level. And that could likely be their last go of it. I mean, so many of these athletes are not going to continue to play. Uh, and as we are signing these multi-million dollar coaching deals, these you know administrators are raking in tons of dollars. Yeah, I do think that the athletes should have an opportunity to get uh, you know, a, a, a piece of what they are actually creating. I mean, that is, you create value, you should be able to extract a little bit of that value for yourself. And so we, I, I am absolutely 100% a proponent of seeing how that sort of experiment goes before we get too stringent and too, like, scared about, okay, how are we going to curb this, how are we going to curb that, how, because we're going we're gonna to miss out on an opportunity if we do that. Now, sometimes, Tom, I wonder if, if, if all of this isn't really a dodge, right? Because, you, you know, m my concern about um, college sports over the years uh, relative to the money that comes in is whether or not the athletes who bring in the money get a slice of that bread. And NIL does not give them a slice of that bread. Um, Nick Saban is not giving up a penny of his $10 million dollar salary um, uh, for his linebacker or his slot receiver. So how does NIL then figure into somehow <coughs> curing this inequitable problem that we have in, in college sports? I, I mean, I think your, your point is right on. Uh, you know, as I said, we need a new social contract. But when you talk about football and basketball players because they do generate so much money, and then you talk about volleyball players, they are in two different categories. Uh, but my, my point on all this is that if we're looking at a new social contract, is there a way that we can bring young athletes into a situation where maybe they share in the TV money? Maybe they end up having this Uber licensing deal. You know, one of the things that we pushed for hard was group licensing. Group licensing is wonderful because you go along with that. It doesn't take any time, but you get a check. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And the NCAA fought that for, for you know, the whole process. We should be doing more of that. But I think the new social contract should allow basketball and football players to have greater benefits, however you define that. But realize, with that comes a commensurate Title IX responsibility. So if I'm going to give a million dollars to football and basketball players, I've got to give a million dollars to women athletes. That's the system of college sports. And I believe you can design this system where you can still say tr true to the values of higher education. One of the things that bothers me a lot is that these $600 million in coaches' buyouts over the last 11 years for getting fired. 600 million would pay for a lot of new kids to go to college. Where we're heading right now is we, the NCAA funds about a half a million kids. In 10 years, we're gonna see that shrink. And I think that's the wrong way to go. We should be funding 700,000 new kids, many of them for inner cities. We ought to be expanding opportunity. And if we're not careful, we're going to give a lot to a few and we're going to take a lot away from many. And I don't think that's the model of college sports. And by the way, we polled our ADs. 97% of them, they never agree on 97% of anything, want a higher ed model. They want to control excesses. They want to give kids full NIL rights. They want to have the thing tightly tied to the academy. Maybe with time vesting and academic vesting to have some of these benefits. What they don't want is to be a mirror image of the NBA and the NFL. And if we're not careful, that's the road we're heading on. Julie, do you see any um, traces of ideas in the NIL bills that you've seen that you think would be good at a national uh, level? I do. I think, um, well, we, uh, 
There's the Uniform Law Commission effort that was um, passed last summer at their annual meeting. Uh, and and that, what specifically does that do? Sure, that is the um, Uniform Law Commission has been around for over 100 years, and they create uniform bills when they see that there's a need, um, when there's a patchwork system. Uh, the Uniform Commercial Code is one famous one that's been used for a long time. Um, and so, of course, they saw a need here, a clear need with the patchwork system. So they started that work um, about two and a half years ago. I um, attended almost all those meetings. Great people uh, working on it, some smart people. Um, Gabe Feldman at Tulane Law worked a, a great deal on it. And um, I think it's an excellent effort. Um, it only addressed NIL policy, not anything beyond, you know, collective bargaining, not anything beyond uh, athletes' rights or addressing health and safety measures. Um, but uh, one jurisdiction, the District of Columbia, has been the only state, if you will, not yet a state, <laughs> that has actually introduced it. So, um, and that's still in the introduction stage, I think, as of last November. So um, it hasn't been adopted by any, any state yet. Um, and uh, again, it's not furthering any athletes' rights. Um, and the obstacle with that effort is that every state has to, of course, agree to adopt it in their legislative sessions. So um, it, it's one effort that's, that's out there. Um, I uh, think there are ex some examples of states that, that are doing something right. Um, the, some of them had in their 2020 bills that didn't become their 2021 laws. Um, those were amended. Uh, some of them had athlete injury funds um, where they would provide for and deposit and fund health savings accounts for, for college athletes, uh, financial and literacy life skills programs, um, which I think we would all agree are, are much needed here. Uh, Maryland was a, a, is a great bill modeled in um, homage to Jordan McNair and included um, some really good health and safety standards, health insurance, uh, coverage for necessary medical treatment and anything related to you know, college sport industries, um, safety guidelines, return to play protocols. Um, and of course, you know, we all acknowledged earlier the, the silent crisis that's going on with, with mental health. So um, there were some states that, that included some great provisions there that are not included in all of the, the federal, um, but I think should be. And Casey, how hard is it to get universities to wrap their minds around these sorts of, you know, these sorts of ideas, right? Because mental health, workers' compensation is out the door um, unless we recognize student athletes for what I think they are, which is employees of the corporation. Um, how does NIL begin to answer this with the deals that you've seen? Yeah, so um, we launched our company about almost two years ago, 20 months ago, with two schools, and now we're at 32. So, I, I, and, and that's, not a, that's, that's not a testament to us, it's more of a testament to the industry. Um, slowly, and Tom knows this very well, slowly accepting. When we started having conversations with athletics directors, the, the, the two responses were, Either, nah, it's not going to be a big deal, or yeah, we're going to be able to handle it just like we had handle everything else. Um, and, I, and I think, uh, without naming names, I think, I think there's um, the, the older guard in college athletics really likes control. And this is, uh, this is a space. What's that? And the status quo. And this, they, they like the same thing that they've always done, and they like control. Um, so, you know, I, I've personally seen the wave of, of the ADs accepting this. I think Tom mentioned. 97% support, or something like that. Yeah. Like, like, they, I, I speak on behalf of ADs to say, like, they support NIL and what it is. Now, coaches are different, and there's this this funky world where a lot of these programs, the coaches actually make the decisions, and and that's the next. I, I think that's the next wave of you, you can call it acceptance, or you can call it. Um, uh, uh, but I don't know, begrudging acceptance, or, or I guess they're just going to have to deal with it. The coaches are going to have to deal with this at the highest level. And I'm talking about football coaches in the SEC and the biggest men's basketball coaches in the country accepting this and, and saying, hey, we need to embrace this in a way that is not pay for play yet. So, Kevin, I, I don't disagree with you that given my past life at the PA, I, like, it looks a lot like employment status. But where we are right now at this moment, is you don't have a you don't have a uh, an arm's length transaction like a collective bargaining agreement like you do in the league, and you and, and without that 
There's no, uh, the word guardrails, I think in this room, it makes everybody shudder, but guardrails or contractually agreed to parameters for how we're going to conduct business. That's what happens in the pros, and I'm not suggesting we should be in the pros, but for where we are right now, without that, and we've seen some of the coaches talking about salary caps and things like that, like that's you know step six or seven, there has to be some level of, uh, of, of, of representation from the athletes that get to sit down with the representation of the administration, the presidents, and saying, okay, these are the, these are the rules of engagement. Because without that, it's just, it's, it's not sustainable. It's truly not. And your bill threatens, yeah. right, the, the one bill threatens uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Mm. So I've, I've got two bills, both with Senator Murphy, who I think was here earlier today. Uh, and one is the um, name, image, and likeness bill. And one is uh, to give <laughs> athletes the the right and the ability to collectively bargain. Uh, look, whenever you have a situation, we're seeing it rampant right now throughout our country, whenever you have uh, a side or like a, a, a tremendous imbalance, you can't have it be where, okay, university, conference, coaching staff, administrator, we're all over here, <coughs> you're over here, one athlete. I mean, that is completely out it's just, it's unbalanced. And so when you allow students to organize uh, for safe condition or e equality, uh, conditions of play, pay, then you have an equal playing field, or at least you have the, the opportunity to get to a level, level playing field. And look, I do think we need dramatic moves in this space. We've been doing the same thing for a long time, and the only people who have really paid the price are the athletes. And so giving more power to the athlete is always where I'm going to come down. And I'm not so rigid in my approach. I mean, I'm watching things like collectives, pay to play, inducements. Look, I want to preserve the integrity of the sport and uh, at the college athletics as well. But I think you can do that by also giving more voice and more power uh, to, to the athletes. And it, just along those lines, I mean, <laughs> it's so funny. Right, I think it was 1995, I just looked this up before I got over here, when, um, uh, uh, when Walter Byers' memoir, or confessional as I call it, came out, right, called um, uh, Unsportsmanlike Conduct, Exploiting College Athletes. I mean, he laid that out 25 years ago. And here we are today still talking about, to your point, the athletes being used up in this entire situation. Um, so, Tom, how how can we how can we make this a fairer system for all involved using NIL, if people want to use NIL, um, to balance this playing field, to level out this playing field? Well, it's a very good question, and so I mean, we talk about the end goal and. You know, my end goal is to preserve the academy, to keep it in line in higher ed, to try to get rid of some of the excesses in college sports. But college sports is a uniquely American invention. There's no other. When I went to Oxford, we didn't have these kind of sports teams. We never had gambling, sports betting on events on campus. The only place I remember at Oxford where that occurred was the crew race in London. We now have very serious issues going on in our institutional fire learning, including enormous billions of dollars of sports betting. So we have to really be thoughtful about this. And I do think there is a, a, a social contract that can really help student athletes, but it has to be done without cutting opportunities for others. We've got to expand opportunities. And that's got to, that's got to be, that's got to be the, the way we navigate this. Because 90% of our ADs feel that the road we're heading, we were just going to cut women's and men's sports. That's what's going to happen. I don't think that's a positive vision for, the, for where we want to go. And so there, there are ways to get to where you want and where everybody wants by creating a new so social contract. How do you get that done? The problem is college sports is so fragmented. The NCAA is a fraction of itself. The conferences are new power brokers. There is no one that you can sit and really negotiate a comprehensive deal. And so, yes, I do think the paradigm has to change, but has to be done in a thoughtful way, preserving the higher education values in this country that we 
that we hold dear and are so important for our future competitively. We can't allow college sports be the, you know, the tail that wags this dog. It's got to be integrated into our system of higher learning. And I think it can be done. Here's one more thing. You look at young uh, black athletes that go to college, they may not have the best credentials going in, but by God, that university with that tutor tutorial system, they come out of there with an education. It may not be a perfect education, but it's a, a <coughs> chance for them to learn. And we need to expand that. We need to create more opportunities for kids. It may not be a perfect system, but by God, you look at those kids coming out of colleges today, and they're getting an education. And yes, they're time stress and all that, but there is a lot of good coming out of this system. And we can't forget that. I just so. want to ask you something and ask Julie. Um, Ellen Storowski has, has written this a couple times, you know, at Drexel and now she's at Ithaca, um, that uh, she believes that um, uh, gender equality has been used as a, uh, almost as a boogeyman when it comes to uh, questions about um, not necessarily NIL, but about uh, how we compensate um, the male athletes who bring in all of this revenue. Um, how do you see that and how do you see NIL as being maybe some sort of remedy so that gender equity in sports, Title IX, is upheld? I think it's a great question. I think one of the things that's been so exciting about NIL is that it's sort of proving the, uh, the inadequate promotion that we see in women's sports as completely wrong, right? We don't fund promotion or advertising or women on broad, you know, on prime time because we just, we don't think people are, uh, we, we don't think people are going to watch. We don't think people are going to be interested. And yet, women's NIL deals and women's basketball, it's football, women's basketball, men's basketball. So one, I mean, you just like, just make that discussable right out of the gate, because we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us as we approach the 50th anniversary of Title IX, right? We've got a ton of schools that are paying 2x uh, on men's sports as they do on women in terms of promoting um, their, their sport. We have 80% of schools that have some sort of compliance issue with Title IX, and then you've got nil which is, or I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call it that. Now you, you have NIL, and it is, uh, it is just this like gem of, uh, of really like it flies in the face of all, everything that people have like been trained to understand about women's sports and how, oh, it won't make money, people won't watch. I mean, for crying out loud, I don't want to see another softball t tourney with record viewership or another women's basketball <laughs> tournament with record, I mean, this is insanity. So I do think NIL actually helps make the case, just in the deals that we're seeing, and it, it is upon us to make sure that we're putting the pressure on to uphold what Title IX was all about, you know, when, when it was instituted. 50 years ago and close those loopholes there are there are plenty and and Julie I mean we've seen uh, we saw right out the gate uh, women being able to cash in on their athletic window of opportunity uh, because of, of NIL um, in terms of what you've seen with the legislation that you you've covered how much of that has addressed um, title IX and, and gender equity issues some of the state laws have, not all of them. Um, and Congresswoman uh, Trahan mentions uh, gender in her, in her uh, HR 50, which I have right here. Um, and I just want to add, I absolutely second what, what she just said, everything. And I think that we hopefully put to bed that bugaboo of Title IX and, and women uh, taking away opportunities. It's, you know, that was the whole fought, battle that we fought in the 90s, right? With college football coaches saying, oh, you're going to kill college football. College football never died, right? <laughs> so I think we can all agree on that. And hopefully this is a myth that we can finally put to bed because now we're showing women actually succeed at, at NIL rights. Um, you know, you saw the statistics of, of women in the final four. We know now that the NCAA has an unfortunate history of undervaluing and devaluing women when it comes to the, the broadcasting contracts, when it comes to attributing revenue to women. Um, not allowing them to have their own, you know, logical uh, corporate sponsorships where, where they can really succeed. And you can see that now with the individual athletes doing really well. So 
it's you know it's a really frustrating thing to hear. The, I heard it in, when I as a swimmer, right, being actually blamed by some of the guys at the training table. You're the reason our programs get cut. What? <laughs> we don't even have the participation opportunities. So hopefully that myth is going to be put to bed, and we can finally just get on board with when women succeed, everybody succeeds. And Casey, how how will NIL impact women's ability to um, cash in on their athletic start? Yeah, I, I mean, so Tom mentioned this earlier, mentioned group licensing earlier. Um, it, I, I look at, from a pretty commercial aspect, it, what NIO was supposed to be is marketing opportunities. So you have sponsorship, you have licensing, and you have t TV dollars, okay? So Julie just mentioned the TV broadcast contracts and the, and the inequity in those. Um, that needs to be addressed. Going to the, call it the smaller dollar deals of sponsorship and, and licensing, the, these, these group licensing opportunities. So sponsorship is when an athlete says, hey, I, I drink Starbucks, right? And that's that, that's, that's that percentage of the highly marketable athletes, men or women, many of which, as we've seen, have been women. The licensing aspect, I think, just like the, the broadcast contracts, you need to look at the video game manufacturers, the trading card manufacturers, the poster manufacturers. And, I, I, and you know, some folks in the room might say, well, you know, that, those are kind of like small dollars. There's a lot of money being made by professional athletes, both men and women, in these categories, and it's all passive, to Tom's point earlier, meaning they sign up for a program, and there's a group licensing agent, not, not my company, but another, uh, there's, a company, there's companies out there, multiple, that go out and they do these deals. Um, and going back to, to my past life, I was working for the, at the NFL Players Association. We went with the U.S. Women's National Team PA. We walked into Electronic Arts, if, you, if you're familiar with the FIFA video game and the Madden video game, we led the Madden video game negotiation. We had a deal coming up in a couple years. We walked in arm, arm in arm with the women's national team to help them negotiate that deal. And, and they were underpaid, and we got them um, a significantly higher royalty rate and a minimum guarantee because we saw the broader aspect of how much money the, the men, the football players, were making, and we just ran an analysis. We said, wait a second, doesn't make any sense. The FIFA, vi the, the, the FIFA video game sells, I think it was something like seven and a half times more globally than Madden. Um, the point being, as um, the broadcast contracts get less inequitable, uh, I think the, the sponsorship opportunities will be there. The licensing opportunities, the video games, those sorts of opportunities need to, fall, or need to follow, and I think they will with more exposure. More exposure. More, more primetime television, people are going to buy more products. They're going to buy more of the, the, the women basketball games, the posters, the, the bobbleheads, the fatheads, the, 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 everything you can imagine you see in stores that has LeBron's face on it or Tom Brady's face on it should have women athletes on it as well. And I know you have to uh, run. Is there any idea you want to leave us with before you depart? Well, look, I think this is an incredibly productive uh, conversation. And, uh, and I keep myself very much open, uh, one, to seeing uh, how all this plays out. Um, but I think it's incredibly exciting, uh, too, for watching the NIL deals that have, been, uh, that have been signed, watching women thrive, watching these, you know, these uh, personal brands of players really flourish. Uh, it's incredibly great for the sport they play, uh, and it is so important as we nurture, uh, you know, the next generation of athletes. And so I think uh, NIL plays a huge role, uh, and I think we do. We have to get it right. Uh, but I also think that we all should remain uh, open to see how this uh, is going to look uh, as we put the, the, the athlete at the center of of the um, of you know the the conversation. <laughs> I think you've ruined that word for no, me forever. No. Uh, at the center of our right. action, at the center of our action, so that we get it right for them uh, and not be too quick to respond to you know each sort of anomaly uh, or outlier and uh, and sort of you know just take a, a much more holistic approach. So so appreciate the the conversation. Thank you for having me. It was great to sit with Thank you all. You. Thank you. So, t Tom, what impact can any of this um, have on these tens of millions of dollars in deficits that so many FBS athletic programs and other D1 programs uh, run right now? Well, thanks, Lori, for uh, being here today. But one thing that uh, 
I'm the only member of Congress to ever put an antitrust bill in in 1991, and it was predicated on the idea that we were going to take this pile of money and we were going to spread it around for higher ed values, gender equity, academic performance, the breadth of your program, not winning and losing. And, you know, I believe then and now that we need a new model that is more congruent with college sports. How do we get there? Which is one of your core issues. Well, how do we get there? I'm not confident that the college sports world establishment, because everybody is really, you know, defending their interests, is going to, it's going to be very hard for them to put together a new social contract. And I think we need that. And, you know, I look back to the 70s when I came back from the 72 Olympics. The Olympics were a mess. They formed a presidential commission under Jerry Ford, and we passed the Amateur Sports Act, or it was passed before I was in Congress. But that restructured the Olympics. I think we may need something like that that creates a win-win not only for higher ed but for student athletes in the future. And I really believe that that's the only way we're going to really get around to this social contract because you're going to have Senator Murphy and, uh, and Congressman Trahan pushing their agenda. Then on the other side, you're going to have others that are going to be fighting against that agenda. And how will we ever get to a place where we can preserve college sports, but also do it in a way that is that is in sync with higher higher ed. And so, to the point of all those programs losing money, it's an arms race uh, going nowhere. Giving the conferences more authority, I was telling this earlier, it's just going to mean it would be like the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, saying to ABC, NBC, Disney, make your own rules, guys. We're out of the rulemaking business. It would be chaos. Everybody's going to run to the, to, there's going to be a big, big uh, race to the bottom. And that's, where, that's what's going to happen is the conferences are not going to disarm. It's going to be just pretty chaotic, I think. And so it's going to call for some kind of national solution. Lori's voice is very important, but there are other voices that need to be incorporated into this. Is there a model? Yes, I do believe there's a model that works, that expands opportunities, that cuts the excesses, that takes care of the student athlete better, that stays congruent with higher education. I think there's a model, and I think it's a uniquely American model, but I don't, I don't know if we're going to get there through you know, uh, jawboning between Republicans and Democrats. I think that's, that's what's going to be very difficult to get the progress we need. And so just my uh, observation, thanks. Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's a lot there. And you know, we, we skirt around the issue of the money and, and how it should be um, divided up, um, who should earn it. Um, you know, I always get back to the fact that you know, no one discusses reining in the salaries of conference commissioners, um, uh, athletic directors, uh, and, and coaches, but less than a year into NIL's life, and everyone wants to rein, rein it in. Um, is there some way, uh, Casey, that um, college uh, administrators can see NIL as being more of a solution to the problems that have accrued over the last 40 years than seeing it as a, as a threat to their existence? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know is my answer to that because of what Tom just said about it being an arms race. Um, and, and, and specifically, every um, one of the things we say to the athletes is ask yourself, how does this person eat when they approach you? How do they eat? Whether it's a financial advisor, whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a manager, whether it's us, you know, everybody around you, you should ask, we say this to the players, right? It's the same thing for these administrators. How do they eat? They, they, they win. They listen to their coaches. So I, I, I don't mean to be a pessimist, but I'm not sure that the system is set up to, to, to because of the individual incentives of these ADs and, and, and frankly the presidents, they're not set up to, to use NIL or, or um, to solve the inequity problems that you identified of the coaches, the massive buyouts, the massive dollars, they're not incentivized to do that. So I don't know about you, I mean, for me, it's like, 
I, you know, how do I eat? How do I put food on the table for my family? That's the, these, these ADs and these coaches, <coughs> the, excuse me, the ADs are, they need to get the coaches. And, and, and it's, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be the, the coach apologist here, but if you were a head football coach at a Power 5 institution, of course you're going you're gonna to push for getting as many dollars as you can for these recruits because that's how they eat. That's how they, they got to win. So I, the, the, the short answer is I, I don't think there's a good answer to it other than blowing up the system. And, and uh, you know, there have been conversations about football uh, being broken off. Um, I, I leave that to smarter people than me, like, like the guy sitting next to me or, or Julie sitting next to me. But I, from, from the incentive structure that we currently have, I don't see it changing. Julie, as a former woman athlete, do you feel threatened by the direction that college sports could head in? I do. I am now. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think um, even when you see, uh, you know, the rise of collectives, I think we have over 100 now with the, just the local um, institutions, uh, mostly, you know, big FBS schools um, that uh, exist now to facilitate NIL deals and, and we presume only work on behalf of, well, we know they only work on behalf of their own uh, college athletes, right? So, um, uh, and some of those are now applying for and, and obtaining tax-exempt status, right? So now we have, um, not, to, not to pick on the University of Oregon, but if it walks like a duck, you know, quacks <laughs> like a duck, acts like a duck, it's part of the institution. So now we have this um, outside organization, this you know, sophisticated organization working on behalf of the athletes. Are they working on behalf of the women as hard as they are for the men? So that's a whole other wave of, of what's happening now that, that concerns me. And I think, um, you know, how will this affect Olympic sports? How will this affect women? Um, are they, uh, they're not going to be subject to the same laws, are they, as, as Title IX or uh, reporting requirements? But they're tax exempt. They're saying we're part of the institution, so they should. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, there's a lot that's happening right now that, that concerns me, and, and the more that we head into that direction, um, it concerns me even more. And I think this is, you know, I agree with Tom. This is a, many are calling it now the race to the bottom. And mm. I think that's may, what we mean. Make, so if I were in Congress today, uh, you know, because at the time, you know, I helped pass the first graduation bill, disclosure bill, student right to know bill. NCAA fought it. You know, I, I saw the system. I know where she sits and how frustrating it is to fight the system. But I also, if I were sitting in Congress, I'd be very concerned about our Olympic effort in this country. You know, because we privately finance our Olympics, and we are about going, we're going, we are really going to do damage to our Olympic movement in this country unless we do it thoughtfully and intentionally how we move forward. And Because I can tell you, you, you're going to have hundreds of Olympic programs on our campuses cut if we're not careful. And to me, if I were in Congress, I'd be worried about that. I mean, I'm also worried about coming up with a new social contract and all that, but I also realized, because America projecting to the world in this day and age through our Olympics is extremely important. And, and so we don't oftentimes think about that, but there are tons of programs going to be cut, and that, that's just concerning to me, that's all. But there's, again, there's so much money being brought in, maybe you need to talk about or, or we need to talk about the redistribution of this, of this revenue. But right? that's a social contract, and that's yeah, <coughs> that that does that does need to be discussed. But left to its own forces, sports are going to be cut without some kind of greater compact. Sports will be cut. Well, does this not then require, and, and you were there in yeah, the seventies? The that's the, what I was trying to say. Tom just said it better than, better than me. I, it left. Left it left on its own. It's not gonna. It's not gonna happen. Now the redistribution of wealth. We all kind of see that should happen, but it's, they're not gonna do it on their own. Because it's 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 toothpaste. It's out of the tooth. Uh, I actually think it's more of you know what I was alluding to earlier is individual economic incentives or, or individual professional incentives. I mean, same thing, right? It's like how do I get promoted? And how do I, I get my next job? And I can tell you the hardest thing for an ADD to do. The hardest thing for to be on a board of regents is to cut sports. I mean, we did that in Maryland, we cut seven, eight sports. It was so hard, but that's happening and it's gonna to continue to happen and that's a, that's of concern. That's but, but, but back to NIL, and I'll ask Julie about this. Um, before there was NIL, and you're talking about Olympic sports, um, Olympic athletes 
uh, on college campuses were able to monetize their uh, athletic stardom. So Katie Ledecky was one of the highest paid um, athletes in the country uh, as a college athlete. Um, Kyle Snyder, who wrestled at my high school until he became a pro, and well, not a pro, yes, a pro, <laughs> went to Ohio State. I think his first year in the Olympics, he earned around $300,000 that year, but was still able to participate in college athletics because of the Olympic rule. So to me, that's, and that's before NIL, mm -hmm. but obviously he was cashing in on the Olympic system and his notoriety. So why can't that through NIL then be applied to the system that we have now as some sort of a remedy? Well, I'm okay with that. I'm sure you are too. I don't know. Is that, is that the case? I mean, you know, this is why Michael Phelps didn't actually attend or, or swim for the University of Michigan, right? He attended the University of Michigan and he did very well, um, but he wasn't able to swim with the team. So I, I think, um, you know, Missy Frank changed. And it changed. Now with NIL, right? He, he, of course, would probably swim for Michigan now. Right. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, now now that's changed. I don't know that Katie was able to. Yeah, maybe she had finished her eligibility by the time that it changed. I'm trying to remember the timeline. But um, Missy Franklin is a, is a great example of someone who um, had to make that difficult decision, right? Do I continue on in my college career, or or do I, um, you know, start to monetize my name, image, and likeness? So. Um, now we don't have to worry about that anymore. But um, I think, uh, you know, largely, uh, you know, with everything that this, Tom just mentioned, I think one of the logical solutions here is to uh, appoint a, a commission here. I think Michael uh, Hosfeld in the first uh, panel today, you know, mentioned that um, everything, all these problems, and there's so many, right, that aren't, aren't going to be solved by, by one document, by one decree. So I think um, with how complicated it is, and Senator Booker said, well, these need to be studied, these need to be worked on. Right. I think uh, at least a two-year commission is what, is what is sorely needed here. I don't think one bill will cover all of these issues. And when I think commission, I think conversation again. And I think about the, <laughs> I think about the impact that you know, someone like Ed O'Bannon had on this entire system, right? That, that you know, it, it, it may take, not may, I, I think it will take another legal challenge. But I think that's the only thing that, that shakes the system. Um, and, and I think that that's been proven over time and just in the last few years. I mean, I, I don't think that the Northwestern unionization effort um, uh, resulted in nothing. I mean, I think, I think the leaders in college athletics heard it or felt it and um, reacted in some way. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I'm not that sh certain about commissions, but I understand what you're, you know, I understand what you're saying. So what, what should be the next step here with, with NIL now that we're reining it in, trying to put up these guardrails, trying to control it? Um, uh, you have athletes who are uh, shopping themselves um, as free agents in an amateur um, <coughs> system. What's the next step? Well, I'm going to say, I don't think they're trying to guard, rein it in. I think that the whole idea of name, image, and likeness is that you should be able to do bona fide monetizations of your publicity rights. The key word is bona fide. That means that you are in the market, you make money on that, and it's not based on whether you scored a, a touchdown on Saturday night. It's really based upon your marketability. And... I just think that the college system can work within those, uh, within those parameters. I mean, Casey's the expert, so I'm going to defer to him. I don't think, I think having this turn into a recruiting circus will not be good for college sports in the long run because it's just going to amplify the stratification. Let me, what I mean by that is we talk about uh, the rich getting richer. That will certainly be the case if if recruits go to the highest bidder, people say, well, that's happening now. It, it is and to some degree, but if you really just take the, you know, the clothes off the emperor here and say, just go at it, money wins. 
I think that will not be as good for college sports, but I'm going to defer to Casey. I just think that some modest, some modest rules here would go a long way. Yeah, I, I, well, I agree with most of that. And, and look, the, the whole idea that it's been happening before, so why not do it above board? I, I don't think that's a very good argument because, the, I mean, like, look, you could say people treat their taxes, let's not, let's not have the internal revenue code. It's like people are going to either break the rules or not. Right, so let's let's so I'm putting that aside for a moment. Um, I think we need to invite brands, national, local, national, regional, and local brands to get into this space. And I've talked to enough brands nationally and agencies of these brands that they're not they, they don't want to get into this space. They don't want to get messed up with all these different hodgepodge of state laws. Um, they don't they don't want to mess with the donors and, and these these weird uh, uh, non-economic or economically irrational incentives of like of winning. They're just like, yeah, we don't need to do that. We can go to the pros. We've been doing this for a long time. Brands, sponsors, big, big spenders in sports, they know what they're doing. We need to uh, get a system that invites these brands to bring more legitimate dollars into this, the bona fide dollars into this space. And right now they're staying away from it. Um, secondly, you need to, uh, uh, we, we as an industry need to, need to figure out a way to um, either rein in the donors from doing the, the tampering and, and, and rein it in, or if you're gonna let it happen, let's all, let's all just be honest and say it's happening and sit down at the table and figure out what the rules of engagement are. Those are kind of the two options in my view of figuring this out, but right now where we are, it's just not sustainable. Of, of the, the tampering and the, the, the race to the bottom or the um, m money's gonna win, and we know which schools, we can, we can guess which schools are gonna win because they're, they're the uh, deepest pocketed donors. And, and one point I just wanna make, when you're at Notre Dame and you get, or you're being recruited to say, a, a big school in the South that has had a long tradition and they're offering you a lot of money to come to that school and you're 18 years old. And I can tell you this, the NBA is not offering 18 year olds these kind of deals. When you play in the NBA and you're the sixth man on a team, you're not getting these kinds of deals. This is uniquely related to the fact that Notre Dame has 150 years of <coughs> goodwill, LSU, all these great schools. And the, the student athlete is benefiting by that close relationship to the school. And because if that student athlete walked out and went to a pro league, they may not get the same deal. So there is some integration with the, with the school on this. And so my, I agree with Casey on this. I, I think you can have very modest, uh, modest restrictions here just to keep the excesses away and still give kids tremendous opportunities to monetize their publicity. Rights. Let me say one last thing. Tapping into the uh, almost like uh, sociopathic recruit uh, ability or need to recruit from coaches. If you can mm -hmm. tap into that to, uh, as a school, as an athletics department, as a university, to go out and hustle for deals, tapping into the need to have higher deals to point to, that's a good thing for everybody. It is, yes. Right? Like tapping into that, um, I I've used economically irrational, whatever you want to call it, the need to win, the need to recruit. Instead of going to the donors and saying, hey, cut the biggest check, why don't you go and you hustle and knock on doors locally, regionally, and nationally to get legitimate deals, you, being pushed by the, the big football coaches and basketball coaches, we all know their names of, um, being pushed by their need to recruit and win to say, look at all the deals that our, our players got, our young men and women got. If you can tap into that in a way that's legitimate, bona fide NIL opportunities, that's a good thing for the athletes because now they're getting paid more. And the, you, you're, um, you're, you're uh, boxing out the illegitimate donors that are just trying to buy kids to come to their, their program. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Did we want to open up uh, Q&A? Um, I know there are a couple of people out there that had some microphones. I agree and with you. Well, I'm sure there's some questions. I agree with you on that. I would love that. That's what I'm trying to figure out. How do we do that? It's a quick question. Why is it, throughout this conversation, considered legitimate for boosters to give however much money they want to athletic departments and schools, but illegitimate for them to give money to recruits. Uh, well, athletes. <laughs> well, well, it's a, well, I'll take it, Tom and, you, and Julie. You guys can hop in. I mean, when when I say illegitimate, I, I don't. I, 
I mean, it's it's pay for play. It's 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 pay, it's paying them to come play their sport, and 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 that's fine if we're gonna call it that's what it is. But now you have an employment relationship, and with the employment relationship comes the triggering of of local state local and state laws, one, and two, unionizing as we've talked a bunch of times. So right now we have this system where we're saying, hey, NIL, legitimate marketing opportunities for athletes um, is, is allowed, but they're not employees yet. And I'm, I'm not taking a position on whether that's right or wrong. Um, I think it's going there. But my point is, if you, when, when I say illegitimate, it's that is for pay for play. It's paying them to be an athlete at that school. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I don't think there's... Like, that's what I mean by that. I don't know, Tom, if you have another answer. No, I, I think the question you ask is how do you differentiate between a what you would consider an excessive deal and a normal deal? I mean, it's a fair. Right. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to just understand mm -hmm. what is the real difference there beyond the fact that athletes are now getting a piece of a pie that's always been available to schools? Well, I mean, it's, it's a very legitimate question. Personally, I wish uh, these things ne never went outside the school. I think the collectives were ill-conceived, and it really, it, it all went back to the original idea that the NCAA, you know, boosters, we have to stay away from them. But... In some respects, I just think this should be, there should be a whole licensing department in the school. The other way to think about this is maybe the school should, with some parameters, buy those licensing rate rights for that student athlete right up front. And maybe that purchase or that consideration is a piece of the TV rights. And maybe with that deal comes the school working hard to monetize additional things and certainly the student athlete can do it on their own. But there's one more thing. Maybe there are some you know, limits on mobility. The kid can't walk out the door. Maybe there's some academic vesting. The longer you stay here, the more money you make. Uh, there are maybe some time vesting. There may be a new model where the school is more intricately involved and it's not left to third parties. That's, that's the problem that I have is you've thrown it out there. I can't imagine the NFL and the NBA allowing their most precious asset, their, their athletes, being really managed by third-party entities um, outside of the NFL and NBA's control. It just sounds like, it just seems like a crazy way to do business. And so I'm much more in favor of integration back to the, to the university. And, you know, there's, this is a very complicated subject, and I'm certainly, he knows more about it than I do, but I would say that having a more integrated framework would probably work better for college sports, that's all. Hey, hey Kevin, um, just uh, hate to butt in like this, but that's a great question. It What's the difference good. between legitimate and illegitimate? And it's the difference between fair market value, what happens when you're freely in the marketplace and you go by fair market value, and what boosters think is your value, which is a bidding game, right? Who has the most money, unrelated to what your real value is, right? That is what makes it illegitimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think there are some economists here who would have, have some opinions on that. <laughs> it's a complicated question. Donna, you're the only one that I would let go before me, that's for sure. Um, Ellen Zavian. I have a couple, two comments and one question. One, um, I sat on the legislation and testified for the Maryland Legislation McNair Act, which was the Bill of Rights for Athletes, and part of that was NIL. We, we asked for an independent entity for athletes to be able to come to outside the university um, to report safety issues and so forth. University of Maryland, my alum, Towson, they all lobbied against it. They said, we have something internally. So I love the fact that you're talking about an external. It's going to be an absolute mind shift that's going to have to happen. Somebody died, and they couldn't do it, right? Someone died on the field, and they couldn't do it. 
Secondly, esports. I think we, we can look at esports. Esport athletes are coming in. They're not necessarily in the athletic department. They have brands they're already hooked up with before they get there. I think there's a lot we can learn and, and see how that structure is working, pitfalls, and make a pivot. And lastly, my question to Tom is, what does that model look like? What's in your head? What does that structure look like? Because to me, if you can't figure out the structure, you can't figure out the revenue streams and how all the stakeholders function within it. Well, let me try to answer the third one. I mean, you know, we've, we've tried to think through this. We've <coughs> talked to the NFLPA on this. We've talked to lots of organizations. Um, the model, first of all, has to be compliant with Title IX. It's the law of the land. It's probably the most powerful force in college sports. So whatever you do is going to have to be compliant with Title IX. And, and that's, that's an ongoing journey, as you well mentioned, Julie. Uh, the second part of it, I actually believe that the solution is more of an Uber licensing arrangement uh, where the student athletes are brought into a big umbrella of po a big tent possibly involving television and so forth. And for that, there is some commitments on their side of it uh, that, you know, that there, as I mentioned before, academic and time vesting. Uh, and uh, that uh, that's a model that would, you know, obviously be more pertinent to basketball and football players. But what I'm worried about is if you go down the employment track, and you know, there, and that's where we're heading through the courts, is you're going to have an athlete deemed an employee, and you know, three half of our revenue in the FBS comes from student fees, institutional support, and charitable donations. Pretty much all of that will go away in an employment model. And who gets hurt? The ones that aren't generating revenue. Who gets hurt? The smaller programs in the country. And so when you go to that kind of Darwinian model, I think there are consequences. So I prefer a social contract that puts a lot more benefits to the student athlete, certainly focuses on health and safety and all those things, but does it short of an, a full employment model. And um, that's and, and I know Casey's talked about this as well. Some th these kinds of things, and uh, I don't know whether that you can get there uh, through the system. But I do think there there I think the uh, turning college athletes to employees and looking like the NBA and NFL I think would be very detrimental to higher education in this country. And at the same time, you have to work on the excesses. So. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you hit it. But um, you've you've commented <laughs> on that before. Give me you what know. the like NFL players Inc. model. Yeah, like the the Uber licensing model. Yeah, yeah. So it, for those who might not be familiar, so like at the NFL Players Association, the NBA Players Association, the Women's National Team Players Association, there's a for-profit arm, it's a wholly owned subsidiary, for-profit wholly owned subsidiary of the 501c labor union. It, it's not in any way legally or otherwise tethered necessarily to a union, meaning you can have that type of entity completely independent of any union. So Tom and I have discussed before, is there a model where there's that type of entity that's going out and doing those deals and the TV, the TV deals would have to be included, whereas in the pros that's covered under this concept of all revenue and the collective bargaining and the salary caps, but you could easily throw in TV money to this licensing and sponsorship model of setting up an entity that's a for-profit entity that, that has stakeholders from the, the external stakeholders, has ex external, uh, an external group from the school to, to, the, to the first comment um, that represents the athletes commercially, but not necessarily in a labor union context. So it's like more like an association. It, theoretically, uh, look, to get, that, to get that done and to get the, um, uh, let me say this, one of the, the benefits of the, one of the legal benefits of having a labor union as defined by the National Labor Relations Act is there's law around how you vote, how, how you, how you uh, elect your executive director, how you get rid of people, how you have boards. That's all defined by the NLRA, right? We don't have that for an association that's representing these athletes. So I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I do think it's theoretically possible. But it could possible. be codified by Congress. Sure, sure. Congress. Yes, Congress could absolutely do that. It's like a pseudo 
employee, employee or a, a short of an employee, a employee where they get all these commercial rights, the athletes do. <coughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful panel. My name's Emmett Gill. Appreciate the shout out, Kevin. I'm a member of the Drake Group and the founder of Athlete Talk. Great shoes, too. And, oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You know, I try and do a little something, something. But um, a couple of really quick comments and then a question. Um, I'm hoping that as we continue the discourse about NIL and athletes, that we consider shifting from the conversation about Title IX and shift that to Title VII. Because the reality is, is what we're seeing now is what we probably didn't believe before, and that's that white females and white student athletes are benefiting to a greater degree than those who have helped create this system. And I think you did an outstanding job of trying to think through the racial implications, but my concern is, is that if we continue this line and not deal with the issues of race, that and this leads to my question, one that we're forgetting about, that this is happening at an educational institution. Yet a lot of the NIL education is coming outside of the institution. And I feel that, there's a, that we're missing something there, in particular with regard to our black athletes. And we heard it this morning from a young athlete who, whose professor asked him a question about why play for the team, why not own the team? The other piece, Tom, is I really appreciate your conversation about a social contract. But a social contract also includes morals. And when we not only talk about race, we have to talk about racism. And I want to ask the audience, when's the last time you bought a product from a black male? When, when's the last time that you bought a product that was sponsored by a black male? You know, the reality is, is that there are a lot of things that point away from our black males. So here's my question. If we're not dealing with some of these issues, in particular these sort of pseudo NIL deals, here comes the NCAA with enforcement. What's gonna happen to these black males who are caught up in these bad deals with these collectives and we really haven't unpacked what they've done? They're being pitted against coaches they're being pitted against athletic directors. They have folks who are working for them who are outside of the system. When they go into the NCAA's boardroom and they're in one of those situations like we see on the blind side, are we going to see those athletes end up <coughs> on the train tracks like those two black athletes we lost because their identity is wrapped up in their athletic identity in this NIL deal? So my question is, how do you see this panning out for the black males when it comes to this NCAA enforcement that's about to come around the corner? Well, I'll, I'll defer to Julia on the title, the comment about Title VII and Title IX. But, but I couldn't agree with you more about the, the young black and brown men and women who are being uh, put on contracts that they have with, with the collectives. And I've seen these, and I've talked to mothers of some of these, these athletes who I didn't know what I was signing. Guy, guy gave me 50 grand to sign away my rights that go into if my son ever plays in the NFL. That's egregious. And, 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 and it's like they, they don't have the representation, and I don't, I don't mean representation in Congress, which is true too. I mean like legal representation around them. They don't have a, an uncle who's a lawyer who can look over these contracts. So that is part of my uh, uh, concern with when you have these boosters and you have no control over them, no guardrails over them, and I know uh, the congresswoman is gone, but like, if we don't, if, if we as a, as a society, as a system, don't uh, rein in that competitive drive from these uber rich people who all they want to do is win and then they, or buy a recruit and then walk to the bar and say how big their hat is and how much money they have, if we don't rein that in, the black, men, the black and brown men and women who, who are signing these contracts, who don't perform or who want to leave or maybe they don't want to play a sport anymore. They're going to be locked in. Um, I, some of you have probably seen this is publicly reported. Some of these contracts that they're signing, they have to pay, the, pay it back with, an, with interest. That, that's crazy. My past life, like, we never, the, these legitimate agents, legitimate, uh, uh, the, the sports lawyers out there, would never have a, allowed an NFL player to agree to that. But these kids, I, they, don't, they don't have this representation. So that's, I, I, that's my comment on that. I, I've seen it, like I, had, like I said, I've seen it with the, with the athletes, I've seen it with the mothers who have said like, hey, 50 grand's 
never seen 50 grand before. And that's part of the problem of the collectives and the, the boosters running, uh, uh, doing whatever they want. And they can right now. So anyway, I, I'll defer to Julie yeah. on the legal, the Title IX and Title Seven. That's right, because they're getting the support of the states uh, with, with little to no enforcement, right? So, and, and the collectives were not contemplated when the state laws were passed, certainly not contemplated 50 years ago when Title IX was passed. So um, you're right, we, if we're looking at a different model than just the college athlete, if we're looking at um, revenue sharing, if, uh, and they're just students, if we're looking at a hybrid employment um, situation. It's it's more than Title IX, which certainly didn't contemplate that 50 years ago, um, nor collectives. But we're looking at we have the Equal Pay Act, we have Title VII. Mm -hmm. So certainly other laws will, will come into play. Um, and I think uh, this is again, like Tom said, this is why we need federal engagement. Just one more reason. Um, I'm I'm Arthur Bryant of Bailey Glasser. Um, <coughs> And I wanted to address a couple of the comments and make a suggestion to y'all. And by way of background, I and my colleagues have done more cases for women athletes under Title IX than anybody in the country, and more, have won more victories for black male athletes uh, than anybody in the country. So I speak to this from both angles. Um, and I want to first start with a question that was asked, what's the difference between the money going to the school and the money going to the athletes? The theoretical difference is enormous. If it goes to the athletes, it, can, it doesn't have to be equal. It doesn't have to be spent equally. The athletes can do whatever the hell they want with it, and you will, not have, you will move further and further away from certainly gender equity, um, and I believe racial equality as well. Um, but in theory, if it goes to the schools, the schools have to treat, use that money to treat men and women equally. Now, the reason I say in theory is because of what we started the whole program with, with Christine Bennett saying 90% of the schools in this country after 50 years are in violation of Title IX. And we can tell you that's true, and we can say any woman athlete in the room who wants to sue, come talk to us. You all have cases. It's outrageous. But that's where we are. And that's why I'm so encouraged by what Tom is saying about his new model and the new social contract. Because he's basically saying, we have to, if I'm hearing right, and it's been repeated, we have to solve this problem and still make sure Title IX is actually being complied with. It's not a trade-off of the money for women's rights, which a lot of athletic directors are now saying. Athletic directors are saying, oh, if we have to pay these kids, then we get rid of the women's sports, or we get rid of the non-revenue sports. Um, and Tom's model is, no, no, no. We have to do this right, and we have to comply with Title IX. But I want to add something that's critical to the last comment, which I agree with you 100%. And it's why we ran into so much trouble trying to force Clemson. We did. We forced Clemson to put back its male, black, you know, track, field, and cross country teams. We used Title IX to do it because Title VI wouldn't let us do it, because the Supreme Court has gutted Title VI and made it basically impossible to effectively enforce race discrimination laws in this country. So when we get to the Student Bill of Rights, what I want to flag, and Tom and your model as well, I think it is critical. Title VI is a congressional act. If you're passing a Student Bill of Rights, you can put in it, not just continue Title IX, but, and, and, but amend Title VI, the statute, to say that you can actually sue to enforce race discrimination based on desperate, disparate impact, not just an intent. And then the other key, the other reason the 90% of the schools are not in compliance is because they put all the enforcement responsibility with the resources really on the kids. The, all of the Title IX law in this country, in the courts, has been made by women athletes willing to sue. Uh, what, what Howard said earlier is if you want justice, you have to fight for it yourself. It's exactly right right now. But the bill could say, Congress has to not, that the Department of Justice has to do a report every year which schools are in biggest violation and has to suit the two worst violators. And if that happens more than a couple of times, the schools will all get in compliance. So I want to urge, Tom, I love the model. It's just making it reality, but it's critical. Whatever the Bill of Rights is, whatever the solution is, we have to solve the race discrimination problem the Supreme Court has made impossible to solve, and we have to ensure enforcement. Uh, 
Hello, how you doing? Uh, my name is Chris Mosley, Delaware State University. Um, I had a question because I'm a little confused about like one part that keeps coming up. So we all know that most college sports is always top heavy, and I don't mean like the big schools. I mean you mostly see football and basketball. That's mostly what you see on TV. But every time NILL comes up, it's like they're saying the other sports are just going to go away because NIL is out of control. But like if all the schools are already in violation of Title IX, why would now the NILL coming in make all these other sports just all of a sudden shut down when there's already been like a money issue either way? Like we've already said that, you know, the college coaches are making $10 million a year sometimes. So if there's already a money issue, why would now the NILL deals cause all these sports who already weren't getting money to shut down? or go away, or be in so much more danger than they already are? Well, I, I, if I understand the question correctly, I, I don't, personally, and I, I think I speak on behalf of Tom, and I don't know about Julie, but I don't think NIL is going to directly lead it, it, at all to cutting women's sports or, or non-revenue sports or Olympic sports, whatever phrase you put. I, I, I want to be clear on that. I don't, I don't think NIL will do that. Um, I, I think what the, the, the argument is, is if we start revenue sharing, like, like the pros, and we start saying, hey, we gotta take, we, we, we have to take this pie that we currently have of revenue as an athletics director, and we have to sp start splitting it up, and we have to pay athletes as employees, and pay them under employment laws, that is when a lot of ADs get to the conclusion of, we're gonna have to cut sports because we don't have the budget to do it. Yep. I, right. So okay. I, I don't know if I answered your question. If I didn't, please, please follow up misunderstanding the difference between uh, revenue sharing and NIL deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I understand what you're saying now, but it just still seems a little strange to me that it's not until now when the NIL deals come up. It's like major issues with all these other things. Well, That's also collective bargaining. Title IX is constantly about when you talk about collective bargaining. I understand. I, I do understand, but like, it's always been a problem. Like some of this stuff has always been a problem. These boosters have always been a problem. But yeah, it's like now they, they we're tried, scared of them. tried to keep the boosters away from the athletes, particularly recruits, I, because of this, because of what we're seeing right now. I work at a school. Our, our school is ranked top five every single year of football. So I, I completely understand. But like before they were starting to be able to make money, this was just always a problem. So like for me, now saying like, wow, this is out of control, I'm like, eh. Well, uh, the, uh, at least the way that, that I, look, I like to look at it is off the field, on the field. And we used to make this argument to, to, the, to my past life at the NFL, we'd say, hey, look, those are two different revenue streams. Everything that happens under a collective bargaining agreement to, to, to what the woman mentioned over here, that's on the field. That's everything on the field. We're gonna talk about that. We're ticket sales, TV deals, we're gonna talk about that. But separately, and in addition to that, we're talking about everything. As soon as a, a, a football, an NFL player walks off the field, now you're talking about something else. And in that framework is, at, at least speaking for myself alone up on this panel, that's how I think about NIL versus revenue sharing. And, and NIL is off the field, off the court, out of the pool, off the mat. And, and that's where there's this, there's this confu um, that's, that is that construct right now is, is, is being convoluted. Those two things with these collectives are being mushed together without the construct of a CBA or employment status or all the other things that come along with um, being recognized as an employee or being paid for your work. Just to be clear, like that, that's, that's how I think about it um, in terms of when I say this is out of control, that's why. It's, it's not, a, it's not uh, distinct like it is in the pros. And feel free to hop in, Julie. We're, um, we're over time. Let me get this one last question right over here. This gentleman's had his hand up for a minute. I want to ask about a potential. Okay. Want to ask about one potential revenue stream for college athletes that hasn't been discussed yet. Uh, Kevin may not know this, but one of the reasons Katie Ledecky uh, stopped swimming for Stanford after her second year, and Franklin stopped swimming for uh, Cal after her second year, was that they were not allowed under NCAA rules to accept prize money for swimming in competitions that are sponsored by ARENA, TYR, other companies like that. Um, 
and the potential here is this. Uh, Katinka Hosu, who swam for USC, earned $300,000 the year after she graduated from prize money alone, not having anything to do with publicity rights or marketing, anything else, just from prize money. The NCAA does not allow that to happen under current rules. I ask why not? Because the coaches of these swimmers all wanted them to compete in these meets because they would be swimming against the best competition they could possibly get. Also, the NCAA has a peculiar rule that does not disqualify high school tennis players from being ineligible for college play if they earn up to $10,000 playing in tournaments. So it's kind of crazy. Why would they allow that for tennis players and not swimmers and so forth? But I'm asking you, why should not this rule just be abandoned and open up this revenue stream for college athletes as well? Sounds like it should be. I mean, <laughs> I mean I'm serious. I don't, okay, doesn't make sense. I want a little applause for this. <laughs> 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 Sounds like it should be. Just, just three um, closing comments. Uh, one, I would be remiss for not thanking uh, the students of George Washington um, University, their sport management program, who have run this conference. So we really, we really appreciate that. Um, second, I want to ask the uh, Drake Board of Directors to come up here right after this session before you drink before you drink. And then third, everybody gets a free drink ticket. There is over there, as you, those doors are gonna open. Are they, no, they're not open yet. But, uh, yes, they are, here they come. Those doors are going to open, and if you show your badge, you will get your first drink ticket. You can purchase your second or third libra libation afterwards uh, at the cash bar. Um, so right now, we will begin our cocktails uh, session, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>